I've asked you to take a look at a couple of different readings from a writer named William Ellery Chaney. He's probably not the most famous guy, and he's not even really a romantic, but he is an interesting figure nonetheless. He was at the time, uh, about 1803 to about 1842, when he was minister of the Federal Street Church in Boston, uh, probably one of the best, if not the best known intellectuals of the time, of the first couple of decades of the 19th century in the United States. Uh, very, very well known, probably the best known intellectual minister, uh, a Unitarian, uh, an early, early Unitarian uh, in the United States at the time. And, you know, people, people, especially intellectuals, read his writings and considered very carefully what he had to say, attended his lectures and uh, sermons and read his books and, and such. So he was quite an influential fellow, um, Unitarian, uh, as I said, from the Boston area, born in about 1780. He's not a romantic, that's true, but he's the kind of fellow that later romantics, people like Emerson and Thoreau and Fuller and these folks, really admired when they were growing up. He was a towering intellectual figure at the time, and what he had to say and what he had written really profoundly influenced that first generation of Boston area, particularly those who were associated with Unitarianism, uh, uh, romantics uh, in their intellectual formation. He was a huge figure at Harvard College, for example, and all of the students there would have known him, studied him, listened to him, uh, and so he can't be sort of underestimated here. There's two pieces of, 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 uh, of uh, or two works here that I've asked you to read. The first one remarks on national literature. Um, it's rather lengthy, but and, and honestly, you can read it fairly quickly uh, without having. I mean, he goes over some of the same ground quite a bit, but it's very typical for the type of call for a national literature that you saw at the time. There were a number of these kinds of magazine articles, editorials coming out at the time that said, "We've got to, we've got to have this national literature. We've got to, we've got to cultivate a national literature." You know, who will be our great Shakespeare? Who will be the great Milton of, of, of America? And, of course, there were a number of reasons why the, the uh, national literature was relatively stunted at that point. Number one, we didn't have a very big population to draw on. I mean, how many literary geniuses can you draw on such a tiny little population? Uh, name the great Nobel literature writers of a country like Switzerland, for example. It's just a tiny population. Um, ours was a big country, but it was a small population. And a huge percentage of those people weren't even literate. Um, and that poses a problem because not only if, if you got to be literate to be a great writer, you have, to be, you have to be literate in order to be a reader of great writing. Um, so if there's no readers out there, or not very many, and it's a small, thin population, you just don't have a lot of potential purchasers of books or poems and things of this nature. Um, he doesn't really address this in the essay, but it is something that becomes obvious once you study the period. One, um, the, the nation had a, a, a declining literacy rate after this, the uh, Revolutionary War because we had a big influx of immigrants. Many of those people, right after the Revolutionary War uh, was won, moved rapidly westward into the frontier areas. They were setting up log cabins way out in the hinterlands. And as a result, they didn't have access to formal education. Uh, you know, if you live uh, 50 miles from the nearest town, you don't come to town very often. And in fact, if you live a very rural, agrarian, frontier, pioneer type of lifestyle, you actually don't have access to a lot of printed material. You might have a family Bible in your home, but that's about it. So right after the Revolution, the floodgates open, and people push westward in, over the Appalachians into areas like Alabama and Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, these areas that had been formerly, at least officially and legally, off limits to colonists because the British didn't want to stir up a round with the Native Americans and the French, um, but uh, one of the sort of the fallout of the uh, Revolutionary War was uh, the fact that you had this massive uh, opening of the floodgates of westward expansion. But with that comes uh, limited access to print material, uh, a very isolated existence on the part of some of these frontiers folks who may not have ever had a chance to attend, for example, a lecture or much less go set foot in a library or anything like that. Limited access to formal education. And you add another thing to that. Um, one, uh, two other things to that. One, um, you know, when, you, when you're out there raising chickens and pigs and farming with corn, you don't have a lot of actual currency. It's a barter economy. And you cannot ask your local Barnes & Noble, because there isn't one, to order you a copy of the Scarlet Letter 
because you can't, and, and then pay with it, pay with chickens. Uh, you got to have money. Uh, a, 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 a literary marketplace has to exist, and that literary marketplace uh, depends upon currency. And with a barter economy, I mean, nobody's going to pay you in chickens for your short, short story. You don't want chickens anyway. You need money. Um, and you don't really have currency. You have a barter economy. The second issue also with the frontier expansion is the fact that transportation just isn't there. There are canals, but there are no railroads yet. There are no superhighways. There's no internet. There's no postal service. How are you going to get the books and the magazines and the poetry out to the people who don't really have any leisure time to read it anyway? So all of these factors, there's a whole slew of factors that, 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 that Channing doesn't really bring up but are undoubtedly in the back of his mind when he's writing this that, that uh, are, are, are posing a huge problem for the country in terms of developing a national literature. All of this concerns people like Channing, who's still living in Boston, and he's saying, why aren't we developing great literature? Um, there are some economic reasons, there are some geographical reasons, there are some demographical reasons. All of those things come to play. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the remarks on a national literature by Channing, very typical of the call for more of this. A few great points that he makes in here that do mark this as different from the standard why don't we have a national literature essay that you read from the period of time is he has a very interesting notion that cultural enlightenment is really more important in a democracy than it is in a monarchy the European countries for example it's a more urgent issue with us why because we have to better educate our masses because we've got to develop a marketplace for literature. That's at least mentioned a couple of times in the essay. Um, we don't have patrons of the arts yet in 1825 or 1830. We don't have that yet. We don't have an aristocracy that can, you know, take a poet under his wing and put him up in the country house and just pay for everything so that he writes great poetry. You know, we don't have anybody like that, like the aristocracies do. We don't have a king who will sponsor uh, a playhouse, uh, and they just work on the, you know, the, on the king's dole to create great literature. So we have to have a better educated uh, set of masses to appreciate literature because we don't have an aristocracy. And just as importantly, we have to have a better educated set of masses because out of those people will become will, will be coming those great writers, those great, in his word, men, um, who, you know, so in other words, the, the bigger the pool of literate, literature appreciating people, the more likely it is you're going to get great writers uh, coming up out of that, because they're not going to drop from the skies. So it, it raises several things that, that are peculiar to the United States itself as a democratic, largely agrarian culture. It's urgent with us. The other thing he raises that I think is very atypical of this type of, of, of essay for the period is he, he recognizes, as I think every American probably should upon reflection, that ours is a very evangelical culture. And I don't mean that necessarily religiously, but certainly politically. You know, we're, we are a culture that insists that others treat their citizens equally as well. I mean, can't tell you how many half a dozen wars we've been in um, where, where we really, really, really feel strongly that other people ought to adopt our political and our cultural um, assumptions, that everybody is created equal, that we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, and so on and so forth. And this puts us in tremendous conflict with much, much different cultures around the world and, and uh, more, you know, uh, cultures that are traditionally not friendly to those types of assumptions about human nature and human rights. Uh, ours is very evangelical in that respect, and he seems to recognize this, that, that for us to export our ideology, we have to be more literate and we have to develop uh, a, a culture itself. We can't export a culture we haven't cultivated yet. And that seems to be a, a really key insight that Channing has here. But he also points out later in the essay that we're actually in a better position than Europe if we cultivate literature for the masses because it's something they've never produced before. We, can, we have a tendency, according to Channing, 
to 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 bewail the fact that oh we don't have a lengthy history and we don't have chivalry to draw on and we don't have Ivanhoe and uh, castles and all of these kinds of things. Um, uh, so so woe is us. Uh, but Channing actually says we we have something they don't have, and that is that we have a democratic population and we can cultivate a different literature than what people have in the past. Um, Marx Channing is a very thoughtful fellow, a sort of proto-romantic, but his likeness to God essay, brief as it may be, really marks him as being a proto-romantic. He starts off the essay asking the question, in what respect are we like God? Um, and it is, a, it is a, a really interesting piece because he defines God-likeness as being the proper exertion of the mind. Now, when you read the essay, you can read this guy very much and say, ah, he's an Enlightenment guy, because look at the emphasis on rational things, on mind, 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 is what he's constantly pounding the table about one's mind, and, and God is the mind, etc. It's the notion of a, a, of a creator who's rational, right? The greatest attribute of God is his rationality. But he's very proto-romantic in his emphasis on intuition. Now, I'm looking through this, and I'm not seeing anywhere where he actually uses the word intuition. But boy, that's exactly what he's talking about here. When he talks about the fact that we have a kindred mind to God, that's how we're like God, in that he has a particular type of knowledge, and we have the capability of that particular type of knowledge as well. And this is not sensory knowledge. This is not Lockean empiricism he's talking about here. That there are traces of infinity in the human mind. We have the type of access or ability to know a thing that God has. And it's not material knowledge that he's talking about here. He says, whence do we de derive our knowledge of the attributes and perfections which constitute the supreme being? I answer, we derive them from our own souls. Note that's very much in contradiction to, uh, to Locke. We don't derive our knowledge of God from the external material world and what our senses encode into our tabula rasas. No, we, we, um, we derive our knowledge of God from internal affirmation from our own souls. In ourselves, he says, are the elements of the divinity. God, then, does not sustain a figurative resemblance to man. It is the resemblance of a parent to a child, the likeness of a kindred nature. We have something in us, argues Channing, that God has in him. And because of that, we have a relationship. And, we, and how do you get to know God? Not through the study of the external material world, not through the sciences, but through religion and philosophy. Very important hymn. He says, For the creation is a birth and shining forth of the divine mind, a work through which his spirit breathes. And we're part of that creation. Okay, So we possess, he says, within ourselves the explanation of what we see. So what you have here is this first really early inkling, this first early suggestion that, that the, the, the enlightenment ways of understanding the world aren't quite adequate enough. That's very important. It's not that Romanticism rejects what the Enlightenment has accomplished in terms of science and literature and art and, and philosophy. No, not at all. But that, that it is too limited, according to the Romantics, in its ability to fully explain our circumstances and get to the big questions that face us as human beings. And, and one of the biggest, of course, in Channing's mind is, what is, what is our purpose here? Why are we here? In what respect are we like God or not like God? Now, he does, it, he does sort of define, define it as this kind of type of knowing, this kind of type of knowledge. He doesn't use the word intuition uh, so much, but he's a fantastic transition figure from the Enlightenment to the Romantics because while he's still kind of viewing the world through the language of the Enlightenment, he's clearly embraced ideas that are not of the Enlightenment. He's clearly, in terms of his ideas, like so many people of the era, outgrown the Enlightenment. Still framing it in Enlightenment words, but he's got new ideas, bigger ideas, deeper ideas than the Enlightenment seems to be providing for him. He's got the vocabulary of the Enlightenment, but he's got the ideas of this new Romantic era. I've asked you to take a look at a couple of different